This time I'd like to invite the kids forward for the children's message. If you want to join me up here, come on up. Good morning. So I've got this thing here, and I want to find out if you know what this is. Does anybody know what this is? It kind of looks like a, like a big metal pencil and stuff. What you do is you put it on a string, and it dangles down below. Now does that make sense? Do you know what it is? No? Anybody? It's, uh, oh, it kind of almost looks like a top. It's spinning around and stuff. This is called what? Anybody? A plumb line. That's right. This is called a plumb line. And do you know what a plumb line is used for? I'll give you a hint. It's not for plumbing. No. Uh, but a plumb line is used. Yes, ma'am. Do you know what it's used for? What is it used for? That's right. You're going to use it to, to make sure a wall is straight. You're absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> so plumb lines are used whenever they're going to build something to make sure that it's perfectly straight. I went around the church to see if it was, if it was straight, to make sure that you know, the, the, the pews were straight and stuff. And I got to tell you, I don't know how to use it. So I'm, I, I, I'm assumed that everything in here is straight and plumb, as it were. Today we listened to the prophet Amos talk about this vision where he saw a plumb line and God said, people aren't following my way. I've given them this perfect way to follow, and they're not following it. So I'm going to leave them for a while. And we're called today to follow God's way. And God's way is perfect. It's perfectly straight. It's perfectly, we can, we can follow the way that God's asking us to. And the only time that we don't is whenever we start following our own ways. And that's a hard thing to do, even for kids your age and my age. It's hard for us to do that. So today we're going to be talking about what does it look like to follow God's perfect way, God's plumb line that's perfect and it's straight and it's absolute and it calls us to live a certain way and that's hard for us to do, but we're going to practice it today, okay? So you can go home and you can make your own plumb lines with little weights and strings and go around and tell your family how crooked your house is. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's pray, shall we? Thank you, gracious God, for being with us and providing us a beautiful way to follow. Help us as we try one more time today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Such good news today, right? Uh, and before, before we begin, thank you for the eighth wonder of the world. That was, yeah, I appreciate that, Scott. Thank you. This gospel um, is in Mark 6. And the last time we heard about John the Baptist was in Mark 1. And we find that he was arrested, and we don't know what happens to him. But this gospel... It, it's, it's like this memory that, John, that, that Herod is having because he's confused about, is Jesus John the Baptist? I mean, what's really going on here? And then all of a sudden, it's this memory about John the Baptist and what happened to him. And it doesn't fit in the, in the whole narrative. Right before this is Jesus commissioning the, the, the disciples to go out two by two. We heard it last week. Go out and preach and teach and, and heal and exercise demons. And if, if you're not welcome, just dust the, the dust off your feet and just go into the next house kind of a thing. And then right after this, Jesus is going to meet with the disciples. They're going to come back from doing all these things. And I imagine they're coming back and sitting with him going, you're never going to believe what we did. I was healing somebody. Oh, I exercised a demon. And then they sit down and they have a meal with 5,000 people. And then Jesus will go and walk on water. But in between all of this is this memory, this story about Herod. And I wonder, why is this in the middle of the Gospel of Mark? Well, I know a, a gentleman that's a, a, a scholar of Mark. His name is Phil Ruggie Jones. He's a pastor. He used to be in our synod. Um, and this guy is amazing. He's an amazing teacher and, and preacher and storyteller. But one of his big claims to fame is that he has memorized the entire gospel of Mark. And he tells it as, as part of synod assemblies and other gatherings and things. And he's really good at it. Uh, it's, it's a gift that he has. Um, uh, and, I, and I love watching him. You can find him on YouTube or Facebook. You can find him out there. And I'll share a link on, online uh, uh, with a sermon um, so you all can take a look at it on our YouTube channel. But um, one of the things I liked about him is that when he talked about the uh, Gentiles in the gospel, they're usually referred to as dogs. He would bark, you know, in, in his storytelling. Um, he, he really uh, got my imagination on fire when I heard it. So when I get confronted with this, dilemma of Herod's story in the middle of Mark, I'm like, 
I wonder who knows anything about this. And I thought, oh, I bet he does. And so I found some study material from him, and I, and I looked into it. And he says this was put in here in the middle like as a holy interruption, as, as kind of like a, 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 to kind of break the flow, but it's to offer hope. And I'm sort of laughing. I'm like, hope? What are you talking about? This is King Herod who's nervous about John the Baptist, and now all of a sudden Jesus is on the scene, and people are saying he's like John the Baptist. And then we have like this memory of him going, yeah, I remember John. I arrested him because he didn't like the fact that I married my brother's wife, Herodias. But I'm the king. I can do what I want. And then he remembers that he had this birthday party where he invited all of the elites, all of the officials, all the courtiers, all the people in the know to his birthday party. And at this birthday party, there is his niece or stepdaughter, I don't know, and he says, why don't you go out and dance for everybody? Go out and dance. Look how amazing she is. She's out there dancing. He walks in the middle and he says, look how beautiful she is. Isn't she doing a good job, everybody? Isn't she great? Look what I provided for you all. What do you want? I'll give you anything you want. I'll even give you half of my kingdom. And so what does she do? She runs over to her mother and says, what should I ask for? And her mom's like, I've been waiting my whole life to say this. I want you to bring John the Baptist's head on a platter. And the girl's like, okay. And runs back to Herod and says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And that's when the king, in the middle of everybody, kind of turns red in the face and realizes, uh-oh, I kind of like John. I don't really want to do this, but I have got to please the crowd. And he says, go do this. And they bring it back. And he hands this platter with the head of John the Baptist to a child. And then the child runs over to her mother like she just found the greatest thing. And look, look what I got. And then the disciples come and take the body away. Hope? What are you talking about, Phil? I didn't get it. But he goes on to explain that there's this world of Herod. But there's also God's world like a plumb line of Christ's presence coming into it. There's this way of being over here with Herod. There's this way of being over here with Christ. And I look at it more as this is the way of self, or this is the way of God, or this is self-will, but this is God's will. So see, Herod is, is power-hungry, right? He just wants to stay in power. He, uh, power is, is, is all he's after. He covets it. He'll do anything to stay in it. He'll make decisions that don't make any sense. People will die because of this power-hungry person, and he's going to do absolutely everything to remain in power. Thank goodness we don't have anything like that happening in our world today. So this power-hungry person is now inviting all the powerful people around him to come to a birthday party for himself so everybody would look at him and he's going to put this child out in the middle of it and go out and brag about the half the kingdom. It's all the show of his power. And he's fearful that he's going to lose it. On the other side of the spectrum is Jesus, who shares his power with the disciples. He says, go out in pairs and heal people like I've been doing. Cast out demons like I've been doing. In fact, you're going to go on to do greater things than these. And afterwards, Jesus does have a party, but it's not for all of the most elite. He goes and sits down in a field with the common folk and feeds 5,000. He's sharing his power. Herod has a family which could best be described as dysfunctional at best, right? So here's Herod who has married his brother's wife. And now he has, I don't know, is he now uncle, stepdad, or I don't know how it all works out with the girl and stuff, but there's like this, it's the amazingly dysfunctional family where at the birthday party, there's this head on a platter and he's given it to a child. So, um, dysfunctional family, dysfunctional family, dysfunctional family for 200, Alex, yes. Uh, so, we have this amazingly dysfunctional family. It's kind of like if you were, I mean, this is not what happens at our Thanksgivings, right? I mean, I've seen some pretty nasty Thanksgivings in my past, but I mean, this isn't like that. I mean, this is a really dysfunctional family. Jesus, however, his family, he gathers people in, whoever they are, and they become part of his family, and he points them to the will of God. Herod is constantly pointing to the self. Everything he does is about him. 
about his power, about his control, about how good he looks, about his kingdom. Jesus is sharing it and sharing with people to seek God's will. Herod, uh, oh, and Jesus also will not give a child a head on a platter. Jesus will welcome the children to him. He will bless the children as they come forth. He will place his hands on their head and bless them. Herod deals in death. Jesus deals in love and life and hope. And that's when I looked at Phil's essay and I said, okay, I can see that. Because you can see the dichotomy between the two. The problem that I have, though, is that I think as a church, we do a disservice to people by saying one is right and one is wrong. Like all of a sudden, Herod is evil. He can't be fixed. He can't be redeemed. Uh, we just put him on the shelf over here as somebody just saying, don't be like Herod. You know, let's all try to be like Jesus over here. We don't have the ability to do that, do we? We don't have the ability to do that. There are plenty of times in my life where I have acted in ways that are very selfish, very power hungry, very protection of what I have and, and who I am and don't want anybody to take it away, fear of what, I, what I'm going to lose, fear of what, 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 what could happen to me if, if, if people really knew the true me, of what I've done in the past and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we've all been in this place. We're all in that semblance kind of like Herod in that, in that place. The good news, though, and this thing that Jesus offers, and it's not just Jesus, it was the prophets, and it was the kings, and it was the judges, and it was Moses, and it was everyone before him all offering the same thing, that God wants us to turn back to God. God wants us to live in this beautiful way, to align our will into God's will, or better yet, along that plumb line, that perfection that is God. Can we turn toward that perfection just today, even for a little bit? Last night, I joked a little bit with the, with the congregation because it was uh, um, right around dinner time, and Beck and I were texting beforehand about where we're going to go to eat, and she says, why don't, we just, why don't we just pick up Bill Miller? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. And then in the middle of the sermon, I'm thinking, and I even shared with them, I'm like, and, and you know what? I've got to go get it. I'm the one that's working. Why can't she go, you know? And I'm like, oh, how selfish am I, Right? I mean, it's an immediately thought. It's, it just happens. It happens to us all the time, right? Where all of a sudden we realize how selfish we're being, and are we able to turn away from that? Or do we live into it? Do we lean into that? Because if we're not careful, if you're like me, I'm going to keep leaning into the selfish end of the spectrum, and someday I could eventually go so far into it that I could hand a child a head on a platter because of my selfishness, because of my power hungry, because of my humanness. God is offering us a different way of living, one that is hope-filled, one that is loving, one that is life-affirming, one that thinks of others before the self. And that's hard for all of us. Luckily for us, we can do this on a daily basis. And today we already did. You may have missed it, but I want you to open up your bulletins to the confession. Pastor Heather stood up here today and invited us to say these words, and we're going to say them again. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life of the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, there is always more than enough. And through Jesus, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven. You are loved into abundant life. Now let's go and live this abundant life for others seeking to align our will with that of God's. For God's will is perfect. Amen.